Oh, this was this was a real mental uh, workout. This chapter. <laughs> yeah, it's a long one. And the thing is, I think and a dense one. It's a dense one. Yeah. So I kind of like um, instead of doing like the whole content in one, I thought like we. Um, so I had like part one and part two, um, and then of course, if people really didn't like the idea, I also have um, the Solomon's uh, this one knitted so that we could use that in, in the event they wanted to go ahead. Like, oh, nice. so, but um, yeah, in my own thing, I just prepared like one. So, I mean, like part one, and then I thought we could look at the exercises. I mean, the, the thing is, it's kind of closely tied to what we are learning in the other one, the, the book, what is that? Um, Practical Data Science, the other book club that <clears throat> John uh, Herman is, uh, is running. All right. And, um, you know, it was interesting because there, uh, he, uh, I think we, the, la the previous chapter was uh, on bootstrapping. And it was, they, he had this link to uh, like a place where you could put in your sample size and you could put the number of times you wanted it sampled. And the one thing that kept striking me was that his sample size was small, like just 25, like out of whatever, like the population size that he was estimating. But he sampled it like 10,000 times. And then I found that as he kept increasing the, the sampling frequency, it approached like the central limit uh, hypothesis. I mean, like the, the paradigm, like that it, it was normally distributed. Hmm. And it didn't make much sense to me because at that point I was like, okay, what is the crux there? Is it more the, the size of your sample? Is it the number of times you, you sample it? Like what is the, and here this time doing this and while it was a real brain bender and I literally like, I felt like I, yeah, it took me a while, but it seems that they are also saying the same thing that when you sample more and you have them categorize better, like instead of doing like one large sample of 10,000 or 60,000, whatever they pull up as their example. And then let's say you break it up into like categories of demographics or biometrics or whatever else, you can start to see other biases that might be inbuilt into your, into your assumptions, like other than just like your sampling bias, you, you start to see other biases, other confounders that you, you know, you may not have accounted for. So I'm starting to think that that maybe is why he actually started to approach the central limit paradigm, even with a small, as small a sample as just 25 samples. But then he did the sampling like 10,000 times. Um, hey, August, how's it going? Oh, good, thanks. Yeah, well, I was, uh, I mean, like, I, I guess like bootstrapping is just another way of what, I guess, just repeated sampling, I guess. It, it's just a fancy term for that. But I was just talking about how uh, in this other book club that I'm part of, which I'm not really doing any work towards, they had talked about bootstrapping and, um, and, and there was a simulation model where, uh, you know, the, the bootstrap repeated sampling started to approach uh, the central limit uh, paradigm. You know, like it, it all started to converge on, uh, on the regular bell-shaped curve. And I think this this kind of does a good job of getting into that uh, because I could I could I could play around with the with the code like it's um, like I re I really want to spend more time looking at this chapter because like inference is something that's so dear to me like I uh, and but a lot of it I feel like I kind of gloss over like the you know like the 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 real meat and bones of it and I this is just such a good chapter to like sink your teeth into because the code, I mean, especially Kurz has done such a good job with the tidy verse there that you can really play around with that, I think, even before getting into other things like regression and stuff. Because incidentally, the next one is simulation. I wonder who's taking up simulation. Is that you, August? Um, well, I, I haven't put my name down for it. I could do, I suppose. Oh, no, no. I think someone had already signed up. So I was just wondering who it was. To the I mean, best it's a short chapter. Yeah, it's a good one though. Like I really enjoy the simulation chapters because it's it's such it's such a nice way to really see like some really like you know heavy duty concepts which you know you never have the time to focus on when you're running a real real world thing because then you're more like into hey where is my model wrong how am I going to integrate that into my workflow how am I going to have reproducibility like then then you get into the whole project management the whole workflow work line pipeline kind of a cycle right whereas this is the time to like just kind of like be a student and and like actually look at everything that leads up to that so well, actually um, I would say that you can use simulation in day-to-day uh, -day work um, because once you've got like say um, a model's parameters you can then use simulation in order to create those um, uh, a bit more information about the distribution. 
Um, so, for instance, um, one of the problems we have in our business is with pricing. Yeah. So with pricing, one of the things you want to do is you want to be able to allow a, a customer to for sometimes be able to see what an optimal price would be. And that might not be a price that they've ever really, they have, but in other products, they'll have, like say, say you have a product, um, let's say Coca-Cola, right? Because uh, it's always a good example to start off with like a soft drink. You'll have lots of different soft drinks and they'll have been sold at different prices. And you can see how that relates I see, to sales. I'm not going to believe this. This is my boss. Give me like one second. This is yeah. so ridiculous. This yeah, is no like, worries. Give me one second. Yeah. Anyway, like, I was going to like the perks of working from home. It's like <laughs> you're, you're considered always switchable. Mm. Well, yeah, that is very true. But like, yeah, it's not changing. No. Um, and on the plus side, um, it's nicer to be at home than have to um, arrive. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Uh, yeah, so. Oh, oh, oh no. Okay. Oh, that was so scary. I mean, he scheduled this recurring meeting every. Tuesday at two, which is why like I'm like I last week I couldn't present and I somehow got out of this and he called me now I'm like someone please kill me because I thought I got out of this it turns out it was on his calendar but he didn't realize that we actually didn't have the meeting so I was like oh heavens thank god because I didn't I don't want to be meeting with him right now so anywho I am gonna go ahead and present Thank you for the template, uh, Mikhail. Um, I, I just kind of wanted to keep it standard for everyone in this group, you know, so thank you for that. I, I, I can recognize that this is our, this is the R4DS uh, template that we know and love so much. So yes, that's true. <laughs> All right, you guys. Okay, so I am also um, gonna, I have a live coding thing set up here. Not that I'm actually gonna do any of the live coding, but I do have it here in the event that we actually wanna change any of the seed things or, we want to, you know, like just play around with it. So um, uh, we can definitely do some some coding because I'm I'm like all for that. I think that that would be awesome. Uh, having said that, I've also knitted a Cursus uh, RMD. So if people are like very excited and want to pro progress further, we could because uh, I stopped it at the the bias part, but that's because I was having a hard time. All right, you guys. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. So. What is um, statistical, wait a minute, is this mine? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and knit this again because this does not look like the latest version. Sorry, one second. Uh, this is, shoot, sorry, knit. Sorry about that. I thought I had knitted the last one, but maybe I didn't. I think I'm knitting the wrong one though. Yeah, this is the wrong one. Let's knit this. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. So part one, um, and of course, um, so what is a statistical inference? It can be formulated as a set of operations that yield yes estimates and uncertainty statements about predictions and parameters of some underlying process. Or population. So um, then they, they directly get into a sampling distribution. So what is a sampling distribution? Um, it is the set of possible data sets that could have been observed if the data collection process had been redone along with the probabilities of these possible values. Okay, so I want to say that one more time. And it is a set of possible data sets that could have been observed if the data collection process had been redone along with the probabilities of these possible values. So when you look at a distribution, not only do you see the data, the underlying data from that distribution, what you're seeing is a probability density function of that sample that you have chosen. So if you repeat that sampling multiple times, what you will see is the probability of those values within that data set. Is that correct? That would be correct. I see August and uh, Mikhail nodding. 
Sampling distribution in general will not typically be known as it depends on aspects of the population and it's not merely on the observed data. So there's no way you're ever gonna approach a population just because of the fact that it's infinite and you will never ever cover all of the possible samples that it could encompass. However, it could largely be reflective assuming uh, what kind of biases and uh, whatever kind of biases are you taken care of or you've not taken care of. And it's not, um, it's, it depends on aspects of the population and not merely on what data you're looking at because that's not the whole data set. So having said that, um, and I have a few questions here. So estimates, standard errors and confidence intervals. Okay, so parameters are the unknown numbers that determine a statistical model. Okay, so if you take a straight linear regression model like what you're seeing here, y is equal to a plus bx um, with the subscript i plus uh, epsilon uh, i, the errors are normally distributed with mean zero, standard deviation, uh, what is that, zeta or theta? What is that? It's not theta, it's zeta, right? Or zeta or? It's, it's sigma. Oh, that's sigma, okay. Oh, so what is the other one that looks like an inverted E? Is that sigma also? Or that's for the population sigma? I, I can never remember how to pronounce that one, to be honest. Okay, so oh. this is sigma though. This this particular thing here is is called sigma. Oh yeah, it is. Okay, that is sigma. Okay, so now what does that mean when they say that errors are normally distributed with mean zero? Are errors all, always normally distributed, or is yeah, this so only? Sorry. If go we go back to the last chapter, mm -hmm. um, the whole the kind of like theoretical idea behind parametric testing, um, or certainly the frequentists and some extent Bayesian as well, is that um, things form a Gaussian distribution when you test them multiple times. So what that means is that even if you've got a uniform uh, number, um, when you test it, when you test it multiple times, mm -hmm. um, so if you have a uniform distribution, that when you test it multiple times, you'll get Gaussian curve. Correct. Of, and as a consequence, that means that that uh, when you, your errors should be normally distributed. So if your underlying data is Gaussian, then the errors have to be normally distributed with a mean zero and- Well, your data doesn't have to be Gaussian. Your, it's just your errors have to be Gaussian. And why? Like, what does that, in, what does that implicitly mean that your, if your errors are Gaussian? So the reason why your errors need to be Gaussian is because um, you're trying to work on the probability of your distribution being correct or not. You've collected some data okay. and you've got a mean for that data. And when you are trying to find out whether it is comparable to, um, to generalize further up, it needs to form a Gaussian distribution because that's the standard model for um, what we would expect to see in nature to some extent. That makes sense. Got it. Okay. Okay. So when you are making inferences, uh, you can say, well, the crossover of these two distributions. So let me just make two distributions like that. So here's my two distributions. And when, you know, the ends are like a bit further out and they're less, whatever, there's less probability of those things happening. If they're mm -hmm. only crossing over a little bit, I can say, oh, well, there's not much probability that there is, um, that these two things overlapping is actually significant. Therefore there's a significant difference. But as they cross over more, then I've got mm -hmm. more probability that the, the because of the because of how we understand the error of distribution, that the um, that there is a probability that these things are the same, and therefore we can't refute the null hypothesis. I got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, what is a special about um, normal distribution? Then is it because, um, like, you can easily compute the area of the area under the curve of the normal distribution easily compared to if you use the distribution then it depends on, for example, the degrees of freedom, whereas for normal distribution, there's the 65 and 95% um, thing, which, oh good. Yeah, because I think I really always take it for granted why the error has to be normally distributed yeah. I, I just think that it will because it has to be like that. And yeah, I didn't really think of uh, why the normal distribution is so special. 
yeah, it's, it's essentially because we need that in order to actually make any inferences because we're basically um, theorized, we have a theorized understanding of the probability distribution, which is in many instances almost a, almost a theorem at this point because you just see it so often. Um, so the so, I mean, it's not always the case, and it's not always going to be the right thing to do, is it? Um, but typically speaking, in most instances, it, it tends to work. It works incredibly well, to be honest. Mm. Um, you know, you see it, you see it all the time um, in all sorts of cases, whether that be academia or whether that be in a, uh, a commercial sector. But Gaussian distributions work really well for just explaining things, even if they're not 100% perfect they're the closest we can get. Well, we have to make some assumptions when we're making guesses about things, you know, in the same way that when we talk about evolution, evolution is we kind of like have a good understanding of the basics, but, you know, the, fund, the, specific, the, the specific mechanisms aren't always clear to us. And I think, you know, sometimes in statistics, we have to think about things as being a, a bit like a ruler, you know, a ruler isn't very good for as you get smaller and smaller, but it's a useful measure for most things. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good analogy. Well, that was, uh, that was good, uh, August. Thank you. Um, okay, so then we have the parameters. So that would be these guys here, A, B, and, uh, and sigma. So I'm guessing the sigma is, uh, is what, like the standard deviation of the error like why is that included as a parameter here but, i actually um, thought it i well my thought was sorry to interrupt you uh, august i thought it was a summary statistic so why is that considered a parameter so it's a parameter because your distribution is based upon it so the okay. gaussian curve is just a way of uh, kind of like saying you're structuring your data um the parameter itself or the value that goes into that is how you actually um, you actually kind of like implement that um, that theoretical structure. So um, so the spread of a normal distribution can vary quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So that's, it doesn't have to be. So it's not set in stone, is it? In the same way that the um, our intercepts not set in stone. So we have to measure that, and then we can say well, this is how much we expect this spread to occur in this particular normal distribution. Well, the um, thing though is that this is more of an internal metric. It's, so while these could influence a model or these could be things that you could want to estimate, estimate uh, mm -hmm. in a model, or you might build a model where one of these is going to be your, your uh, whatever, like this, you're holding this as your difference between your control and treated or whatever. This is something that you um, internally know about your data, like how, how, what is the spread and what is not, but it's not something that you would measure or report on as a final outcome or something like that, correct? So this, this is really like not in the same genre as this because these in theory could potentially be influencers in your model. I mean, this could also in principle, but you know what I mean, like it's, it's not something that you're gonna like, uh, like when you have a linear regression and, and, and you're trying to look at, you know, how the regression is going, like you're gonna look at this, you're not gonna look at this as a possible metric. Um, sorry, and, Nicole. Yeah, so, uh, well, what I understand from the text is that we can use the sigma and all the other parameters to, simulate a new uh, data. And I think it, it's, it follows really nicely with the subsequent chapter. So the sigma oh. itself is also very important that like we sort of uh, make a summary uh, of uh, our data yeah. and then we use those parameter to um, simulate a new data. That's what I understand. Okay. Okay, all right. Um, okay. One of the ways to think about this is if you were simulating the data um, again multiple t multiple times, which is actually effectively um, one of the ways that bootstrapping works. Mm -hmm. um, you need to have a distribution, um, and so that distribution will help to tell you how much, for instance, if you've got say multiple betas. So over here we've got an A for your intercept, 
but usually in a linear model we'll have multiple uh, beta coefficients correct and so if you sometimes you want to know whether those beta coefficients um, overlap or not and where because if they overlap a lot then you can actually just get rid of one of them yeah yeah um so but when you're predicting upon them as well they may become less useful as say one particular measure increases mm. um because you get interaction terms and stuff like that but like uh, but the point is is that these uh, the betas can overlap and you you need to know whether you need to keep them or not and that um so yeah if you're simulating data it's quite useful uh, but yeah uh, mm. i'm waffling now <laughs> okay okay sounds good okay a and b are also coefficients so these are parameters but they are also coefficients is that right okay uh okay and your sigma is a scale or variance parameter so i mean technically it's standard deviation but obviously sigma square is is variance right so that's why they they're calling it scale or variance because squared it could be the variance okay um the estimand estimand or quantity of interest is a summary of the parameters i thought this was really so nice the way this is called call this way so and of course this is the formula we know and love um a is your intercept and b is uh your slope in the in the most simple sense of this formula okay so um standard errors inferential uncertainty and confidence intervals okay so what is a standard error it is the estimated standard deviation of an estimate and so here's the thing okay which is really throwing me in for a loop okay so you can have a standard deviation on anything so even if i am doing uh, if i want to know what is the standard deviation of say all of my b parameters i could get a standard deviation of that i could get a standard and if i had multiple beta terms here i could get standard deviations for all of my beta terms and that by itself would be a distribution of of those parameters so when you're looking at standard error it it doesn't have to be a standard error of your outcome variable or of what it is that you're trying to measure you could pretty much uh cal compute or look at standard errors of any parameter or coefficient in your system is that correct and do people do that so you could when when they say estimate this could be anything on the left or the right hand side of that equation going very simplistically with the with the linear regression so it could be either of that and so is that correct that you could have a standard error on any or is it typically restricted to like maybe a mean and that would be um how you you determine what your standard error is based on the mean well you multiply the standard error by 2 then you'll get a confidence interval right so yes yeah that's correct mm -hmm. and, and especially i think in in biology i can attest that um so many uh, in so many papers i see that um people use standard error for yeah. the summary statistic instead of the standard deviation because yeah. the standard error is not actually um like a summary of the data but it's yes. summary of the estimates yes. and yeah. by design it will the it will be tighter than the standard deviation and yeah. it give you know like a false impression that they have they have such a precise estimate but of yeah. course it's it, it, yeah i just hate that when it, when i saw that in the wild i see i always personally preferred the standard error and the reason for that is because the standard uh, deviation kind of goes the other way which is it tends to sh over, show too much overlap mm. Um, and as a consequence, when you when you got t testing, like say you you know those bar graphs, we have bar graph like this, and then you got your error, you know the p values across the top, and they're showing a difference with you with your um, with your error bars. It's like, well, it doesn't look like there's a difference, so you have to pull those shorter. So it's often like a graphing technique, I yeah. personally find. But I, I would always report standard deviation in tables, but put the standard error in the graph. Well, that's how oh. I used to think of it. Well, okay. as long as you show the actual data points, then I'm fine with either. But the thing is, mm. uh, I usually see people only show the standard error, and mm. yeah, that's it. 
<laughs> yeah, that's not good practice. But here's the thing, though. In biological samples, how do you get that many variations of your estimate? Because, okay, for reproducibility, what at, the, at most you do a sample thrice, right? Like three times a triplicate sample. So when you're doing an estimate and you're getting the distribution of the estimate, so let's say I'm looking at um, what is my treatment um, outcome of this drug. So I'm looking at, I'm, I'm just measuring some, whatever, some enzyme quantity. Um, and that's, so that's the, 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 my why is, is the level of that enzyme. So if I'm looking at the standard error for like treat, treated versus control, I'm not going to do it more than thrice on in, in one, like in, on, on a plate, right? So on, even if I do it, it's going to be like three times of three. So three wells repeated three times. Okay, let's say there's nine. So when I get the standard deviation of an estimate, then it's, it's just going to be the average of what I get of that mean of that treatment, but that's like averaged three times. I mean, like that's over uh, three, three attempts, correct? Because that's what you're doing. You're not actually looking at the data per se, you're looking at what you measure from that data, which in this case is the mean, and you're looking at the distribution of that mean across your triplicate experiments. Is that correct? So how does standard error work in such a small like uh, sample? space or is this wrong what I'm saying I feel like I only use standard deviation in when I was uh, doing experiments like a lot I, I did a lot of ELISAs at the bench and so and so standard error I wonder how in the biological sciences like do don't you need like a larger like sample set to do that or what am I just completely like over like misunderstanding this hmm. You know, what you're saying makes sense, but I'm not sure. Maybe because I just take whatever R gave me, gave to me for granted. Yeah. And, you know, you can yeah. always get numbers out of R, right? But yeah, you I'm could. Yeah, I'm sure. It does that really well. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I just want to look at this really quickly. So um, you see these labels here. So two times your standard error. This is your hack beta. So this is what is being measured. Okay, so you can see that here you have a D norm. So this is a, a normal distribution with a mean of zero and uh, your standard deviation is one. Uh, and then what you're doing here is, uh, what is this hat beta and okay, so let's just take a look at the plot. Okay, so literally what this is doing is distribution representing uncertainty in the estimate of a quantity of interest beta. So beta hat is the mean of your estimate, yeah? And these are your, uh, and this is the distribution of your beta. So they have done this. Okay, so if you're going from minus zero to five with a step of 0 0.01, that gives you, what is how many samples? Like 100? Yeah, I guess that's 100 steps. Okay, so uh, continuous distribution. So I guess this is pretty straightforward, right? All they have done is to give you the standard error of your estimate, which in this case is your mean. So the, the, the estimate being plotted here is the mean, which is your beta hat. And this is the distribution of that. Is that correct? And this is one standard deviation. And how do we know that here? Oh, because it's uh, it, it, it goes up to like one SE. So they haven't gone past one. So I don't know where the one SE Cutoff is, is maybe right here. It doesn't have it on there. Yeah, it doesn't have it on there. So, okay. I so mean, basically yeah. Use yeah. that data in order to construct a whole whole Gaussian curve. One, yeah. one, of, the, one of the beauties of um, a Gaussian distribution is that um, even if you've only got 100 uh, samples or even 30, you can then create the rest of the uh, curvature. Uh, oh. so, their theory, so the rest of the curvature is kind of like theoretical. And that's how, that's that's kind of how you use it. So this kind of this curvature is not really what is being is is not really in the data. It's it's just theoretized. Yeah, because you wouldn't be able to create um, if you've got just ah. hundred points. It would be a lot more jagged than that. Um, it so it's like thing. a smoothing, almost like a smoothing function that's going to apply to it. To like, okay, I get it. Exactly. Well, It'd be like you know when you put a, do a linear model and it's yeah. just a straight line, but you've only got say you know. 30 samples yeah and then but you can predict what would happen with say 500 samples based on that line 
correct. But in this case, we do it with the curve instead. Got it. Okay, so in theory, if they had changed the binning or whatever they are doing, they could have come up with a smoother, like they could have come, maybe not as smooth as this, but you know, yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. Okay, okay, so that kind of makes sense. So this is your okay, so beta, and so mind you that this beta was one of the coefficients. So they have literally plotted the probability distribution function of just one coefficient. And so if you had a if you had a model with multiple coefficients. And if you did this kind of a distribution for each one of them, so what does it say about your model? Is your model, I th and I think they, they talk about this in the book, it's a composite of all your coefficients is what they say in this book. So when, when you say something is a composite of all of that, what does that mean? Does it mean it just takes the, so like, I mean, let's say I have like 100 different things possible here. I have like and 10 coefficients. When you make a statement like you're taking the composite of all your coefficients, what does that even mean? Like where in this spectrum would a coefficient be picked? Is it, is it something that reduces your, your loss, something that gives you a lower loss function, like whatever minimizes the loss or like, what is the deal? Uh, so a composite, uh, when they're talking about composite in terms of like several betas, it wouldn't be in that one curve. There'll be one. No, no, no. Curve I know. For yeah, for each, for each beta. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So there'll be one for all of them. So when you're basically creating a model and trying to work out what value to predict, you kind of need the other beta inputs in order to predict the y. But how how do you pick the beta, like which is most applicable? Like how how do they decide on the beta? That, you find that, that, all that all depends on um, what information you're given. So the whole point of a, so a linear models, um, like say your app and you want to predict iPhone sales. Yeah. Um, you need to know, for instance, what country you're in for a start, because different countries might have different yeah. like speeds of selling. Then yeah. you might want to know what time of year it is. Um, then yeah. uh, on top of that, you might want to know like what what particular day of the week it is. So you might want to sell it on a Friday rather than on a Tuesday yeah. because you like, can get more people down the shop. Like, then you want to know, uh, for instance, what's the um, current state of the economy in that country. Right. And, then, you know, and then also like, for instance, like, you know, what's a particular shop. And then, you know, you can, add, you can just keep adding all these adding coefficients on top of each other. So yeah. each coefficient, sorry, each thing that I'm talking about is a measurable variable that you can put into your model and then you add those things up, additive model, and then you create your um, your y value from that, and the distributions are of each of those variables are used to create the error term for those uh, yeah. for the whole y overall, yeah. which is where it's composites. So that's where, where whatever minimizes your error the most is likely going to be the the combination that wins the jackpot, right? So like that would be that would be the one that you go with because that would give you the least error term. The RMSE would be the minimum when you, when you did that. You certainly want to reduce your errors. Um, the extent to which you can reduce your errors um, is variable. Like it depends on how wide ranging certain factors are. Like, um, so for instance, like, you know, I said about the nation, national one. So yeah. there's 200, there's 200 plus countries in the world. Um, and some of them have more um, people in them than others, so you weight them. But like, um, oh. but as a constant, that's very that's a very wide ranging yeah. ranging constant in your model, isn't it? Where yeah. comparably, like to say, where where is your shop in that particular country, and what's yeah. the po what's the population density there? That's a lot more specific. Right. You know that. So that's kind of like, yeah. Um, you know, you can minimize it to some extent, but you've got yeah. a lot more variation in some measures than others. So yeah, it's just more about accurately capturing the data. Right. You don't want yeah. a constant though, because that's bad. Uh, like if you just got one number, it's not, it, yeah. it will ruin yeah. most models. Yeah, that's like, yeah, underfitting it or something. Yeah, that's right. Gotcha, okay. Oh, okay, so what is a confidence interval? It's a range of values of the parameter or the quantity of interest that are roughly consistent with the data. So um, here uh, they start out with 100 simulations. Do you guys see the cool little cursor thingy? It's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a Sharingan extra feature. So as is this, like I, I really love that so much. Um, so we have the mu and sigma, and of course there's a set seed, uh, normal distribution. 
Uh, and I presume that this is the the your thing, right? Your cutoff for what is that like uh, one uh, one SD and two SD, right? The 0.67. Um, not quite sure what this is, but I think it has something to do with how it's setting up your boundaries for that. Um, and then um, they finally have the plot. So the line in the middle is your, the horizontal line shows the true parameter value and the dots and the vertical line show estimates and confidence intervals obtained from 100 random simulations from the sampling distribution. So the true parameter value has been determined how, so how did they actually get the true parameter value here? Is this? So if, if you, if they, simu they simulated it there. Um, so they've got a 95 confidence interval and um, a 50% confidence, I can't remember what the, they've got two confidence intervals. What they should have done here is color them differently. Um, because there's yeah. two different there's two different kind of like uh, confidence intervals, and what yeah. they're trying to demonstrate is that over your simulations, if you've got like say, estimate fifty oh yeah it's fifty versus ninety percent confidence interval. Yeah. So the fifty percent confidence intervals should cross over with the same basically the same distribution mi minus the reduction of confidence intervals. They should be on the line fifty percent of the time. Um, or be within the uh, distribution 50% of the time, rather. Whereas yeah. with the 95% confidence intervals, there should only be about 5% of these distributions where they don't touch the line, the, 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 the line that crosses through. Got it. Um, and the darkened portion, as, is, that the, is that your um, confidence interval for each sample? I believe that that is the, um, the one standard deviation. That's one standard deviation, I see. Yeah, if you go okay. back to the code quickly. Um, yeah, you've got, sorry, you've got, no, it's not one standard deviation, it's a 0 0.6, yeah, it, sorry, it is, it's 0 0.67, that's one standard deviation. So 0.67% of the data. So that's this, right? You're looking at the fatten. Is that what you're, is that how you're assume, uh, making that? Or... How yeah, I don't you... really quite understand how they paid that little bit itself um, in terms of the plot, but I believe that the fatten part is is meant to be the one standard deviation in from the uh, from the mean. From the mean, yeah, from the mean. Okay, size is one fourth maximum. Size is a half line range. Zero point six seven. And do you know what the one ninety five one fifty represent? I mean, um, the 1195 and the 1150. 1195. Give back a second. Uh, Y-min, Y-max. Um, oh, upper and lower. It's an mm. L, not an I. Yeah, not quite sure. But, uh, so, okay, yeah, so that's... It's, um, a, it's upper and lower value from so the mean. That's one standard deviation. Gotcha. So, uh, confidence interval. So, um... When you, uh, can you guys hear me? You can, okay. So when you uh, talk about confidence interval August, are you always talking about one standard deviation away from uh, the mean or what is gonna be like in a 95% confidence interval is that that's gonna be like more than one. Well, what we're right? saying- That's what, like when, more than one confidence interval away. We need to think about the term here. So the term's the most important part. So when we're saying 95% um, uh, confidence interval, what we're saying is we expect that 95% of the time um, that are, we're 95% confident, <laughs> sorry, we are confident 95% of the time that the distribution that we found will capture um, the observed value um, or, or will contain the observed value. Got it. So when we've sampled something, with ninety five percent confidence, we'll see that again. Well, the thing though, why have they highlighted only one standard deviation away from the mean? Like, I mean, why not two? Because two would still be lesser than ninety five percent. I mean, sorry. So, is this only referring to one standard deviation away from the mean? It's, it's just to good. it's just to show the uh, where the density of the distribution is. So, oh, it, I see. so it's kind of like if you take your um, if you take your curve and then you flatten it it's to show that the density is highest in the middle. It's highest in the middle. Okay, got it. Got it. Okay. 
Um, just one more way to think about that is like, say, say you've got a load of, or- <laughs> say you've got your curve probability curve like this, and you've got a load of oranges um, inside your curve, yeah, and you squash it down. Well, you most con- uh, but the oranges can't move wide. Then your most concentrated orange juice is going to be in the middle, isn't it? In the middle, that's right. Um, it, it, it's a really bad way of trying to explain the what they're trying to do with, by flattening it there. By flattening it, okay. Got it. So the true parameter value will show. Okay, okay. Um, Mikhail, did you have any questions, or can I, shall I move on? Um, yes, I do actually. So, um, well. I'm actually quite intrigued in the text um, in the part on the standard error. So in the, um, I think the fourth paragraph, it says that if the model is correct, then in repeated applications, the 50 and 95 confidence intervals will include the true value 50% and 95% of the time. And the, um, the assumption if the model is correct, really caught my eye because how can we know that the model is correct? Hmm. We don't. That's, it's, it, 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 that's what makes it scary. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've based uh, the majority of uh, data science on this, uh, yeah. and science in general. But this yeah. is also why we have so many false positives as well, particularly, and also it also explains why. Uh, uh, what they call draw studies or desk studies are so bad for science because mm-hmm. it's um, you're hiding one sample, you're hiding lots and lots of samples that didn't meet the significance criteria, mm-hmm. but there could be 95% of those samples not fitting that criteria, which would mean that the one or three or four or five findings that have been made that support a hypothesis are completely inaccurate or sorry, represent a poor theory because the rest of the data isn't there to complete the set. Gotcha. Got it. Okay, so here they are doing a quick summarization of uh, what part of your uh, values are encompassed by, um, you know, the 95% and then the 50%. So you can see that 98% of your values fall in there. And here 52% of your values fall into that. So like it's, it's pretty spot on um, in terms of uh, how much it's encompassing. Um, okay, standard error for a comparison. The formula to compute the standard error of the difference of two independent quantities follows the form S, standard error of your first um, quantity squared plus standard. So they're, they're basically additive in nature. So let's take uh, this example of 400 men, 57 of, 57% of whom are voting Republican, 600 women, 45% of whom are voting Republican. So if you look at, um, actually, let's see, what is it? 400 men, 600 women, 400 men, and out of which 57% are voting yes, so your estimate for your men is, yeah, so the number of the ones who are saying yes or when, so this is your standard deviation, right? Wait, no, this is your, this is just your, your ratio, right? Just because it's, it's a number of people that are voting yes over your entire population. So this is just like your proportion of people, of men who are voting yes. And then your standard error becomes your, those who are voting yes times those who are not voting yes divided by n yeah so square root of that okay so that gives you the standard error that's correct and then they compute the standard error for women because 45 percent of them are voting yes for republicans so same thing here uh the gender gap and the square root of i mean the standard error difference so the estimated gender gap is where they just uh, subtract uh, your number of men, uh, the, the, the ratio of men voting yes from the ratio of women voting yes, and that difference is 0.12. And then your standard error difference is 0.03. So that is your... Mm. So... 
yeah so that is your cumulative um, standard error difference i mean it's not really difference right because it's um, you're actually i guess summing up your standard errors here oh, is that your... think of it like two overlapping squares and one square is slightly smaller than the other it's the uh, it's the sum of the squares difference which is a way to think about it but like you know you usually see it as a curve right but when we see some squares with you know squaring values in order to kind of understand the kind of geometric difference mm. and so, so like you know if you go on brilliant brilliant's really good for this um it kind of like does things in like squares so like one square is like this size and it's kind of like well how do you calculate the difference between the two squares it's like well We've got the value for this, but not the value. But we've got only got two values for this. Mm. Yes, and the way to do it is you just take this value from that value. I see. Okay. And that's what they mean by difference. It's just kind of like how much of it doesn't overlap. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that gives you zero point zero three. And as far as standard error goes, I'm not quite sure how where that falls in that in the range of stand values for standard error, I guess that's, that's okay. Um, okay, so this is kind of interesting and something I just absolutely had no clue about. Okay, so sampling distribution of the sample mean and standard deviation. So I had no idea that a standard deviation follows a chi distribution. Um, and so that was, okay, so anyway, let me start from the beginning, end data points normal distribution of these data points with the mean of mu and standard deviation of sigma. This is your sample mean, and this is your standard deviation. The sample mean is normally distributed with, uh, okay, so that is your mean, that is your standard deviation, which is uh, all of that looks normal, fine. However, your sample standard deviation itself has a distribution which is chi-square with n minus one degrees of freedom. So. Is it always true that a standard deviation has a chi-square distribution? I had not a foggiest idea that this was the case. Like, what is it, why, why is the standard deviation, why does the standard deviation have like a chi-square distribution? What makes it like that? Or is it only in this instance? Because it seemed like they were making a generalized statement, right? So if you go to um, go to page 53 in the book, sampling distribution of the sample mean and standard deviations, normal and chi-square. So does anyone know what this is? Or this is a generalized statement? Sure, it is also my first time hearing it. Right? Well, like, not that I have um, heard a lot about this topic uh, previously, so. Yeah, yeah, that's true, same here. I know, maybe if we proceed then it will unfail uh, one by one. I mean, like for example, the standard deviation already in the formula is already got the degrees of freedom thing going on because it's already subtracting out one because of the fact that it's uh, subtracting the mean from that. So just, this, just the, the formula of the standard deviation is already taking into account the degrees of freedom subtraction, right? Um, but I didn't know that what made it a chi-square distribution, like, uh, but anyway, okay, so here we are doing a simulation again. Uh, and so for this here, again, the mu is six, which is your mean, and this is your sigma. Uh, and uh, run the simulation 10,000 times. So set seed, uh, let's see, what is this, S-T-Y, S-T-O-Y, and then, okay. And then they are doing this one, S-T. Okay, 
mutable seed is from one to 10,000. Mutate S is equal to map double of seed. Okay, yeah, so, okay, I get that. So the, the formula is being invoked where we pass the, okay, so, okay. Is it generating a normal distribution for each of the 10,000 times that you're calling it? So it would appear that if you're calling this in map double, which is a per function, and you pass the function to it and the function is um, uh, simulating this. Uh... Yeah, so the seed has one to 10,000, which means there are 10,000 entries. And you're calling the function against each one of those entries. And each of those entries is doing a R norm, which is what, simulating a normal distribution, right? So you actually have a distribution for each one of those 10,000 entries, is that correct? It seems that way. Um, our norm is random normal distribution. So um, it should be just creating normal distribution with some random numbers. Correct. So the, the number of samples is 100. I mean, the, your sample size is 100 and you're doing it 10,000 times. So it's like the example of, so you have the parameter values and then you use those to simulate the data. Correct. So when you do that, you get a mean of 100. Not quite sure what this is measuring here on the Y. Actually, maybe I should take a look at what Y is. Uh, X, oh, sorry, what X is? X is S square plus N underscore sim, whatever the heck that is, N underscore, oh, okay. So uh, two times your standard deviation of 100 minus one over sigma square where sigma square is your standard deviation square. Standard deviation square. I don't know what this is. Does anyone know what quantity this represents? This thing on the x-axis? What does it even mean? Sigma square. Like n square, I can understand. What is sigma square here? Uh, they use, they use um, some notation. I don't, I don't quite um, understand sometimes uh, because some of the notation I looked at is a bit different, but like, I think I, this is a pure guess that it's Z. Um, so Z, like, you know, when you create Z score, it's a position a in yeah, a distribution like a curve. Yeah. Of, so I think that the, these are Z scores and it's just getting, it's saying, well, it's it basically plotting density, isn't it? Um, by using the different distributions. So it's creating a, it's creating a, a random norm, random number from okay. the mean and sigma values, and then basically saying what the chances of creating value at each point among, along this particular distribution. In, and then it creates this density function based upon that. Um, and I think that's meant to show a uh, chi squared, how chi, a chi squared distribution. Okay, um, square. how does a chi squared distribution because work? If you square a z score, it becomes a chi value. It becomes a what value? Um, if, so um, oh. I've got it written here. Um, the, the x squared distribution, the chi squared distribution, is related to the standard normal distribution. If a random variable z, that has a standard normal distribution as is written here, then the square of Z has the chi square distribution with one degree of freedom. Now, if we do that multiple times, then we get a whole distribution curve. So does each one of this generate like a whole range of Y or is it just one Y? That it's, just one, it's just one Y, but they've created like 10,000. 10,000 of them. Okay, that's so that's what created what the curve. Got it, and that's what has created that curve. Yeah, so you know before when we only had 100? Yes. We only had, uh, it, it, this is kind of like the same thing again in a way, but we've done it 10,000 times. And rather than plotting yeah. the line, we've plotted all the, um, okay. all the values. And that's where we've created this density function. So what is the difference between a z-score and a t? Uh, what is the difference between a z-distribution uh, and a t-distribution again? Um, isn't t distribution defined by the difference 
between the two values rather than the similarity. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that sounds about right, but though I would never have been able to say that correctly. I think that comes up later though, so. Um, I think all of this comes about later. I yeah. don't like the thing is this is all very dense theory, um, yeah. and once we get into the modeling part of it, you'll re-encounter these things, yeah. but in like a bit quicker. It's but like um, I don't know about you guys, but when I was studying neuroscience, virtually every single lecture I went to, this lecture series started off with doing the action potential to the point where I'll never forget it, which <laughs> is <laughs> horrible which is horrible but the point is is like i'm sure that when you went to university you got exactly the same kind of thing it's just drilled into your head again they and again, again the same concepts over and over again yeah but it works really well like so because <laughs> they'll just uh what they call flag flag it to you later on at yeah. this point in time we have to, like they just want to get you rip it stuck yeah. into your head yeah. and that's what i'm hoping it is because i've forgotten loads of this but this part you've remembered <laughs> hmm well, yeah, but then you wrote, I did a lot, lot of statistics classes and this has been drilled into my head again and again. And yeah. I'm a bit more worried about the more Bayesian stuff. The probability distributions always seem yeah. quite simple to me uh, because of hearing it so many times. But when it comes to the Bayes part, I always, it always just doesn't stick. Well, yeah, gosh, that stuff is hard. Yeah, I hear you. Um, actually, that was one of the things I was going to say, like going forward is um, I think one of the key things actually to learn is really the notation because the notation is where you really learn the theory and start to understand things yeah. things rather than actually the r code and actually that's what i think is really good in this book that it forces yeah. you to learn the notation i see okay well that's good that you brought that up because i was not paying any i wasn't paying particular attention to that but okay yeah yeah i think i have to have an allergic reaction to the um, notations that i if yeah. i encounter in equations and i just gloss over it yeah, I hear you, right? Like anytime it's any LaTeX or like a formula, I'm like, Psh, forget yeah. it, I don't care. But yeah, I think that's a valid point, August. I, I, I think that's, that's a really good point, actually. Um, okay, well, uh, so it's 3.02. I really didn't want to go over. Um, and so that's why I was going to call this part one because I knew I had so many questions. Okay, degrees of freedom arise with the chi-square distribution. They relate to the need to correct for overfitting when estimating the error. Um, so I think this is kind of like, it's pretty, in, uh, I mean, like it's the stuff you've heard before. Um, N degrees of freedom. Regression with K coefficients is set to use up K of these degrees of freedom. So in other words, if you have, let's say, 10 betas, um, and then, uh, and, and your data points itself are 10,000, then is it, it doesn't mean that you actually don't have 10,000 data points, but you have 10,000 minus 10 regression, but since your K coefficients would each use up 10 of these degrees of freedom, correct? Es essentially, uh, you'd probably 11 actually, because you'd have the intercept as well. Yeah, that's true, the intercept, yeah, that's right. Okay. And also okay. then if you add polynomials onto it, then you lose more yeah, degrees of freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's all about the amount of degrees of freedom compared to the samples, because as you lose degrees of freedom, you start to um, uh, break down the data and the more you give freedom to your model, the less accurate it will be for predicting or for modeling what you're actually modeling the data. Well, you know, because the previous things led me to believe that the degrees of freedom are only used for standard deviation, but no, you use, I mean, chi-square is used in other instances also, not just when you're trying to look at the standard deviation in your data, correct? Though that's what the previous section seemed to indicate, but where else would the degrees of freedom be uh, applicable? Um, I can't think off the top of my head. Um, outside yeah. of like, you know, I'm just trying to think how we apply them in ARIMA modeling. Um, because an ARIMA model in itself has lots and lots of movement in it, but, hang, but that's caused by different factors and then we have the autoregressive part and the difference thing and the moving average and those all different those might be three degrees of freedom i don't know sorry i'm just thinking no 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 that's fine that's fine is that applied um, for every distribution is my question or degrees of freedom like 
a normal distribution, a, a, a Gaussian distribution, or is it is it more for the the T distributions or for the Z distributions? I mean, um, let me just add something in the chat quickly. So I, I can show you what uh, different degrees of freedom actually look like because I've got I've got it here, and it shows you from the chi squared distribution. Um, so if you just go to this. Um, so isn't normal distribution is like a t distribution, but if your degree of freedom reach, uh, approximates infinity, the sort of thing. Oh, for a normal distribution, is that right? Your degrees of freedom approximates uh, infinity. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, I don't know about that. So if you, if you go to the link that I had in the chat, there's a there's an yeah, image. I just, yeah. Yeah, there's an image in it where there's three lines. Uh, three distribution curves. Oh, it's a bit down, down a bit further, uh, a bit more. There we go. Right. So, if you've got one, uh, one degree of freedom, you don't have much movement. So it kind of goes up and down. Yeah. Go back. To, you see the blue line. That's like one yeah. degree of freedom. Yeah. And then the red one is five. And then, as you get more information, you then approximate a normal distribution. And so, so basically saying it's it is so with less data, the distribution becomes more kind of like squashed and then it pulls itself out as you give it more degree, as you give it more data. And this is really representing your parameters or coefficients, right? This is a, this is a representation of that, not your data points like that is not what this is showing. Uh, I think it's more to do with just um, more to do with the spread, isn't it? So when you get all of your data together, what you can, what assumptions you can make. And so as you get more data, you can approach normal distribution. And as you can, so, which means that normal distribution and degrees oh. of freedom essentially are related. Whereas if we have less data, um, so maybe that's why Mikhail said, distribution. gotcha. So maybe that's why Mikhail said that with the normal or Gaussian, you approach closer to infinite degrees of freedom. Because that's approaching. I mean, that's that's normal. So, is that what is that what you meant, Mikhail? Mm, I was more talking about uh, how t distribution relates to normal oh. distribution, for example. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think it's a different um, topic. Mm. So the k is actually for the number of coefficients in your model, then, like. The yeah, more so coefficients that you have, then the more, the wider range of values that you cover. Is that it? That's what I thought too, yeah. That's what I thought too. I think it's a case of the more, um, the wider your, um, say, number of samples, for instance, the more you can make assumptions about um, the spread of uh, about data in general. So when you're making prediction, if you've got more degrees of freedom, you can, yes. because, you know, like you said about, in, you know, infinite values, you've got yeah. an almost perfect distribution. So you should be able to make a perfect yeah. prediction. Whereas if you've got like, say 10,000, you're closer to that. But if you take away some of those values, you then start to introduce uh, less accuracy into your model or yeah. theoretically less accuracy. Yeah. It's quite a, it's a really, really high level concept, by the way. Uh, like they never explained it properly to us when I was doing my, uh, when I was at <laughs> yeah. university. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's really uh, just incredibly dense and it's hard to like wrap your brain around, which is why I think you lose so many people along the way uh, that don't actually make it to statistics, even though it's such an interesting, because it's, it's just such hard concepts and I, I don't think people knew how to explain it. And now, of course, the R stats community does just a marvelous job of that, so. Statistics is banging your head against a brick wall until yeah. like eventually it just it goes is. in, uh, yeah. you know? But it's like, um, it's, it's so iterative and it's, it, you have to slice and dice it in so many, so many ways and so many perspectives and to actually have it sink in. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I hear I've you. got to say, this has actually been one of my favorite chapters so far. Um, this one? It, it, it's hard. Um, it, there's, no, there's no denying that this book has been dense and difficult. 
so far and we're only into the fourth chapter right but i've got to say like you know i feel like i've learned from it whereas um whereas a lot of the other things with like programming it's a case of practice 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 eventually yeah. comes out but with statistics yeah. there's no way around it you can't you can't learn it just by doing your job you have to be yeah. taught how it works yeah um you know and you know actually i'm quite thankful that you guys are doing this to be honest because i've been looking to improve my maths for a long time right yeah so i think um so i'm 10 minutes over so i'm really sorry guys um i won't keep you any longer so i i was going to cover part 2 next time and also look at the the chapters really quick that gets into the hypothesis testing etc um this is just somewhere place where they have a vector and they are looking at your uh, mean and your standard deviation and then they are attempting to compute uh the standard error and of course now we know how easy it is to do the standard error computations as well so this is your 50% uh, and then this is your uh 95% yeah so you can see that the 95% is much narrower oh oh wait 50% um that's weird so um how is it that a 50% is narrower than a 95% um August, am I getting this wrong? Because I would have thought so that's that correct. A fifty percent would be narrower. Oh, it would be narrower. Yeah, because it, it it captures less data. Because um, if your confidence interval is shorter, you're kind of like cutting off the tails, aren't you? But then I thought if your confidence interval is smaller, that means you're more confident in your estimation, right? No, it's the other way around. If confidence interval is oh. higher, you yeah. um, sorry, not not you're more confident. You are more confident if you're using fifty percent. um but when you're trying to capture data yeah you when you reduce confidence interval you reduce down the amount of distribution that you're accepting for uh, saying well this is how much overlap i expect between one thing and another oh so if you go, if you go back to that um graph that you had where you had lots of simulations this um, one oh uh, this one yeah i know yeah that one which should which you would be best contextualized by like comparing a 50% confidence interval with color one yeah actually i think the i wonder if the dark one is actually the uh, 50% confidence interval well and it says the horizontal line shows the true parameter value so i think uh... yeah so the 50% confidence interval is uh is sorry 0.67% of a standard deviation isn't it that's what it meant earlier sorry i got that wrong so the so the black the dark black lines only cover the true value oh. half of the time 50% of the time whereas the whole line covers it 95% of the time oh so is this the whole line 95% or is that 100% the whole line is 95% I got it. Okay, that's right. I sense. got I definitely got that wrong the first time. I'm okay, sorry. Okay, so this uh, is the 50%. Yeah. So um so if you go back to the code and you look at that um yeah. where it says 0.67 that's zero that that is 0.67 of a standard deviation is 50%, 50% of the data. So when they've then fattened that out that that is basically the um that is the 50% level so that's what that's why when i said oh it should be colored actually they've already counted for that so they're considering one standard deviation okay never mind i shouldn't go there um 0.67 of a standard deviation got it so that is your 50% confidence interval and this is your 95%. Oh sorry, hang on. 0.67% of data is one standard deviation. Oh, no wait. Oh god, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no no, you're doing your best. Um This is the problem is the little details that kill you. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing I'm not doing a test. Oh, this is so hard. Okay. 2%. So what we are looking at in the darkened is actually the 50% and the the whole line is 95% then. Yeah, I believe so. Um oh yeah, it, right so I've got it here. 68% not well it says 0.67 standard deviations 
from the mean is approximately 50% of the normal distribution. So if our distribution oh. of our data that we collected, yeah, so if if 50% of our data which we've collected is from the mean, then that, uh, that makes up our 50% confidence interval. So if 50% of your data is one standard deviation away from the mean, that gives us our 50% confidence interval. Yeah, essentially we, we use um, the standard deviation as a confidence interval for the distribution that we've collected the sample on. And so what you're seeing here is the 95%, which is actually two standard deviations away from the mean, probably. Yes. Um, maybe more, I don't know. No, it's, it's two. It is two. Yeah. Holy crap. So your confidence interval is nothing but your standard deviation. Well, that's that. It's kind of like you create a standard deviation and you use that to say, well, 95% yes. of the time we would expect this to happen. But when you, when you do have a 95% confidence interval, by having that, um, when you see data analyses, mm and you look at the confidence intervals, well, confidence intervals at 95% are massive. So um, you can mm. say, well, 95% of the time we're confident we'll, we'll find the mean or find the true result. So when we're making inferences about two distributions overlapping, well, we need to be 95% confidence that we'll find the true mean within the, those distributions and when that comes to the overlapping, well, how does that apply to the overlapping part? Because there's a lot of variation there, which is why you want your, uh, your true kind of error or difference in the two distributions to be as big as possible. I got it. Wow. I feel like I really did learn this time, you guys. I really do. Wow, what do you think, Mikhail? That was a cool session, huh? Uh, Mikhail's gone. <laughs> well, Mikhail has left. Oh my God. Okay. I didn't realize that. Well, August, I really have to thank you because you have, oh, you have really taught us a lot. So thank you so much. Um, well, I, I, it's only this bit, to be honest. Um, hopefully, um, you know, I'll definitely be learning a lot more from you guys later on. Um, well, I don't know about that. I think you're already way ahead. But anyway, I think it's uh, maybe it reinforces your learning. So hopefully it was good for you also. But Thank you. I have severely overshot the time, but I learned a ton and I appreciate it. I'll do part two next week. No, thank you. This is a great presentation. Cheers. Hey, you bet. Bye. Okay, take care. Bye.